Hi, I thought I'd shoot a short video. I'm working on a customer's new tone model 2055-2056. This unit was sent in by Carl, and this is a tube-based uh, AM-FM music intercom master station. This unit was made in 1964. I've worked on it over the last day or so as parts came in for it, and I've got it sort of jury-rigged up here on the bench before I put it back in its faceplate and button it up for good. What I've got set up here is I've got the master station. Uh, two base models uh, have a 110 power plug in here. So I have this as a special adapter cord that you use for these models. Got it hooked up to my Variac variable power transformer and my Simpson 390-2 volt and amp meter. These pieces of equipment are necessary to have when you work on two base models so you can monitor how it powers up and make sure that you don't have any fundamental problems with it. This one's been running for about an hour and a half now. It's on standby. It's pulling about 42 watts, which is just about what it should. And it's all warmed up, so let's go ahead and turn it up. The sound quality on it is very good. The reception is also very good. This is an AM and FM model. Even though back in those days, Newton did make less expensive AM only models, the primary problem with this unit was age. We had a couple bad vacuum tubes. There were a lot of bad uh, old style tubular capacitors. The primary electrolytic can capacitor, this is a three section can capacitor, was in really bad shape a lot of leakage in it, there's a couple small electrolytics in here, and of course, like all of these sets when they come in, a whole lot of really bad solder joints on the bottom of the board. So I just thought I'd do a quick video on this. I'll shoot a follow-up to this when I get it all buttoned up and back together, maybe on the bottom of the unit, I'll show you what that looks like too. Just thought I'd shoot it really quick. See you soon, bye. Hi, this is part two of the 2055-2056 video that I shot a day ago when I had it set up on the workbench for initial testing after the rebuild. And now I've got it all reassembled back in its faceplate. I've got it hooked up to my Bariac and over here where you can't see is my watt meter. And uh, it's been on the bench now for about an hour. It's all warmed up. I do have it turned on right now. You can see the pilot light right here. And I thought I would just do a quick finish up video on this. So the 2055-2056 was sort of a mid-level model back in the early 60s. It has both AM and FM radio. It has a shared uh, tuning dial with a single movable pointer and a tuning knob. You have a selector switch. It does have a phono input, which is on the bottom of the chassis. And then AM, FM, AFC. AFC stands for Automatic Frequency Control. It was a circuit design to help prevent the FM tuner from drifting once it was locked in on a station. It was kind of so-so, but I guess probably kind of advanced back in the day. And then standard FM here. So I have it set oh and then it also has system volume control and a tone control here and then your master volume that's for this speaker built into the master station in these slots are where the room control switch block assembly goes which is this this is part of the wall housing installation this is not the one that goes with this set this is one out of my stock and I just pulled it out for clearance reasons to make sure that one of my modifications, which I'm going to show you, uh, worked the way I wanted it to. So this would be mounted through the back of the faceplate like this, and the switches protrude through the openings in the faceplate. Take that out. You have two pos or three position switches. When you move the switch to the right, that puts that station in the radio intercom position. Center is off and left is listen in or monitor. So it has the three standard functions that most systems had back in that day. And then you also have an intercom control. This is all tube sets are three wire sets and all three wire sets have simply talk and listen switches on all the stations. So it's pretty easy to operate. So let's go ahead and turn this up. Oh, my God.
and that's FM, and we'll go ahead and move up the dial. Future appreciation. There's no monthly front, and then then it got turned into a big party. And we'll go ahead and turn it back down. So reception on after the rebuild is fairly equal AM and FM, which is what we're looking for. Since these early models, uh, if the reception is fairly close and fairly clear and you can receive most stations up and down the dial we don't mess with them a whole lot there aren't a lot of adjustments as it is and if it works well oftentimes it's best to leave well enough alone so this was a very successful rebuild i'm going to turn it around and show you sort of a brief overview on what's on the back and one of the modifications we did during the rebuild here we're looking at the back of the 2055 and you can see it's a fairly simple and straightforward design. It only has six vacuum tubes. There's one tube here, which is for the FM tuner, and then tubes spread across the circuit board. Contrary to what most people think, vacuum tubes are actually very long lasting. It's not uncommon to see these types of tubes. They'll last 40 years before they need to be replaced, and even then only one at a time, not generally all of them all at one time. Primarily what goes wrong with these sets are they're affected by age. You know, this unit is 51 years old and as well as it is designed, I don't think anyone at Newtone in 1964 imagined that it would be in service for more than 50 years. The problem with these types of sets are vacuum tubes generate a fair amount of heat and the heat takes its toll on the circuit board that everything is soldered to and also a lot of the what were in those days called tubular capacitors and I'll show you one of those they simply fail due to age and the primary culprit is this this is a multi-section can capacitor and let me show you what the original one looked like so here's the original one this has three section in, sections built into it, so it's like three capacitors in one can. This, surprisingly enough, is a cardboard tube that's filled with uh, the materials to make it into a capacitor. The three sections are 80 microfarad, 40 microfarad, and another 40 microfarad, all rated at 200 volts DC. One thing I'll caution you about is vacuum tube sets have high voltage in them. It's not like modern solid state electronics where it's all primarily low voltage. This is actually the power connection. This plugs into a socket in the wall housing and this is 110 volts and there is up to 270 volts in some sections of this chassis. So when you work on these units you have to really know what you're doing. If you make a mistake and touch the wrong thing and you have your other hand on the chassis you can get quite a jolt. It'll knock you on the floor. So these are not generally sets that amateurs should be working on. It should be someone who's qualified and aware of the safety concerns with a unit like this. So this original can capacitor, this was mounted down in this area sort of horizontally in the set. This of course is no longer available. In fact this type of design for multi-section can capacitors aren't really used in modern equipment any longer. There is a company that makes replacements for them. They're based on the original Sprague brand caps. One of the limitations is one you have to find values that are as close as you can to the original values but what you'll see here is that the replacement can is about 50 percent bigger and there isn't any way to mount this horizontally in this section it's the diameter is too large and it's too long and it simply won't fit and the consideration on this model is the speaker block assembly this has to fit in here when the unit's mounted in the wall. So there isn't very much room right here. In the original design, the small one fit well enough, but this big one, there's no way it would fit. There's not enough length between this tube and the end of the chassis, and I don't want to cut the chassis apart and try to do it that way. That would be kind of messy and ruin the chassis. So what I do on is, 
we use a standard, this is actually a, a can capacitor mounting bracket, and then we fashion this bracket here so it's bolted through the board, through the metal chassis with a nut and a washer on the back, and then it angles it off to the side and it's bolted in place. The idea here is that this is mounted securely. There's a little flex in the bracket, but certainly that's not going to cause any problems. You really don't want this flapping around in the breeze and just lying it in here loosely or trying to fasten it in with a wire tie or something like that. It needs to be really mounted securely. On the bottom, there's individual wires that are soldered onto the individual terminals of the capacitor, and those are all heat shrunk, and then a large sleeve of heat shrink tubing uh, to cover the body of the can and then where the solder connections were made down here just to encase it all so there's nothing out in the open. You can see this in more detail if you go to the website. You can look at the pictures of the rebuild. I took them as I was doing it. So this is a pretty good set and should be very long lasting. I know the customer is anxious to get it back. So I'll just show you one more thing and then it's going to get shipped out probably today. Just to show you how things have changed over the years, this is one of the original high voltage capacitors that was on the chassis when the set came to me. This is rated at 0.22 microfarads at 400 volts DC. And this is an old fashioned paper and epoxy capacitor which was very common back in the 50s and 60s. And of course these need to be replaced. And so here's a modern replacement for it. Same rating, 0.22 microfarads. However, this one's rated at 630 volts DC because that was the closest to 400 that was available. It's always okay to go higher in voltage if you need to as long as you don't get silly about it. Uh, you certainly don't want to put a 1,000 volt cap in, in a place that required only a 100 volt cap to start with. But if, when you're rebuilding vintage gear, there has to always be a little give and take. This unit has probably much higher tolerance than what the original one is. This is rated at plus or minus 5%, which is pretty good. And you can see that while the new one is probably only a third smaller than the original one, if this was rated at 400 volts DC, it probably would be less than half the size of the original one. And that's one of the byproducts of modern electronic components nowadays. Everything, is get, everything gets smaller and smaller over time, and that can create challenges. Sometimes smaller components don't mount well, or there's other considerations when you're doing that. So it's just some of the challenges of working on vintage gear. So this was a good rebuild. It's a nice set. I'm going to pack it up and send it back to the owner. Thanks for watching. I hope you found this video to be helpful and interesting. If you did, please wait, zoom out. Please like it on our YouTube channel. If you think our videos would be helpful to other people, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Subscribing raises our search rankings on YouTube, which means more people will find our videos and we'll be able to help them too. The subscribe button is down there on the bottom of the page. So please subscribe. Thanks for watching. See you on the next video.